What's up, what's up? It's time for Done Way Past Funny. With your host, G.D. Fenderson. Join us as we take a look back at the early works of seasoned comedians before they were seasoned with this week's guest, Rhonda Handsome. It's time to get down and get dope with Gun Way Past Funny. Hi, I'm G.D. Fenderson, Certified Forensic Humorist at Large, but I'm losing weight. Uh, thank you for watching Gun Way Past Funny. Uh, where we look at the works of seasoned comedians from before they were seasoned. Uh, my guest this episode is the Nina Simone of comedy, Rhonda Handsome. Uh, how's it going, Rhonda? It's going <laughs> great. I'm here with you. This is this is very <laughs> exciting. We, we we work so much together, and we almost never have a personal conversation. So it's going great. I'm on uh, your that's... show. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, yeah, that's true. We we talk a lot, but we don't get to talk to each other very much, you know. Except for it's like, all, it's all on messenger. It's all yeah. on messenger. Yeah. yeah, and when we're and when we're talking live, like during Zoom, it's like usually we're critiquing each other's work. So we're not really, it's not even critiquing. It's like, uh, I, we think this word might be funnier, or was that a typo, Glenn? <laughs> Did you mean to say that? <laughs> so, but we're we're appreciating each other's work. Uh, that that's true. That is true. Because I am in in awe of the talent that we have, and also the not just the talent that we have. Okay, for the audience, when we when I'm talking about us, we we, we both work or both work for work with. We both we both um, contribute. Con yes, right. We both and con contribute. To yes, we both contribute to Politipod. Yes, we both contribute to Politipod, which is a political satire um, podcast, which. It gets produced every two weeks. Available so, on SoundCloud. <laughs> Sorry, At the late the last episode dropped on. Uh, I forgot. I I can't even see it. Tell it now. So that's. But aside from the Politipod, Rhonda has Rhonda has many many hats. Uh, comedian, actress, producer, and at any time if I make a mistake or leave something out, you can correct me, Rhonda. My feelings. You can't hurt my oh. feelings. Yeah, so my I pleasure want... to correct a man. I love, it. I love <laughs> yeah, it. I have no problems being corrected. I have no no feelings left to hurt. My first wife got them in a the divorce. So... Hey, good woman. Good woman. <laughs> so, actress, producer, director, um, comedian, and have I left anything out? Oh, and also oh, like radio, radio talk show host, host, hostess. Well, I, I, my hashtag is Radio Rhonda because I spend every Monday night with John Fugelsang on Sirius XM Progress, uh, channel one two seven. Uh, John's show is called Tell Me Everything, and uh, every Monday night, uh, it's Handsome Monday when I show up to throw my two cents in on whatever he and his audience have on their minds. And it's replayed on Tuesday mornings. Because <laughs> that's how I was catching it on Tuesday mornings on my way to work. Yes. But now, but now I'm retired. I don't leave the house. <laughs> Who wants to leave the house? I mean, <laughs> the safety of the cocoon. <laughs> well, I... I I need to get out the house because I will drive the cat crazy <laughs> and drive my wife crazy as well. So uh, the first thing I want to ask you is, oh, well, and so I mentioned that she was a comedian. She's been doing comedy since 1980. Um, that's those, when I started. Yeah. That's when she started comedy in 1980. Uh, did you start in New York? Is that? Uh, you, yeah, I, I actually was in, uh, Canada on vacation and I went to a comedy club and I saw all of these white guys everybody was doing jokes about Star Trek and I'm going well I can at least be as funny as these guys up here you know uh, and uh, I, I went home and started working on it I had already been involved in improv for, for quite some time okay. and uh, yeah and 
with the First Amendment Improv Company, and we had done an audition at a uh, uh, a, a very uh, respected club, the Duplex here in, in Manhattan. And the director said that I was hogging the stage during our audition for the Duplex, and I thought I was just filling the void. You know, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's what you do. And I I th said I, maybe it's time for me to branch out on my own and uh, and the stand up. I love it. I absolutely love it. Now, you've been doing this for like I said, long enough that, well, let's put it this way. Are you at the point where you still do open mics? No, I, I don't do open mics, but I do try to get in sets when I can. Um, it, it's, it's not uh, a matter of uh, that I have anything against it. Uh, it's just that I, I prefer to get paid. I understand. I understand. I I. I, I <laughs> I at one and earlier in my career, when I when I once I got the grasp of what an open mic was, I started doing this set in my set. I started doing this joke about the, the modern slavery of comedians and how we and and the reason why I started doing this because at the time the NBA players were comparing they, what they were going through to slavery, and I'm like, yes. yeah, but you're getting paid, comedians. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get. You know, we're doing open mics, we're providing all this entertainment, and we're not seeing a dime. Well, I do have to tell you that when I was opening for big name acts like James Brown and Anita Baker and the Pointer Sisters and Aretha Franklin and playing venues like Constitution Hall and Radio City uh, and Vegas and Tahoe, I was getting paid. And now I'm at that point where if I had some management, I'd be more than happy to give them a percentage of whatever they could get for me. But yeah. open mics... Uh, I don't want to disparage them at, at, in the least because if you really want or if you need to practice something, say you're going to do a TV set or, or some kind of broadcast and you just want to hear those words come out of your mouth, you can go to an open mic and, and work some stuff out. But uh, I, I, um, I, like, I like going where people... I know I'm going to have an audience of people who appreciate me. And I just did something uh, this week, uh, la last night at uh, a little place called Poco. I had never been there before. But I kept praising the audience. I, I actually said, you know, I I'm going to take you home with me if we can sign a prenup. Because... <laughs> Because you know, because we both do political comedy, that yes. uh, sometimes people don't even are are not even aware of what you're talking about. They don't they don't right. know what you're making fun of. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, it was like uh, two and a two two years ago, I was talking about Will and Jada. And a lot of people didn't know, you know, about the entanglements and about the references that I was making, you know, and and now people know. But uh, I find that that happens with me a lot because of the the, um, the the publications or the things that come across my desk, what I'm, what I'm reading sometimes, not all the time, but it sometimes puts me ahead of the curve yes. and uh, and and with our our mutual endeavor of Politipod, I was so happy when what I was working on for the real news, uh, uh, as the anchor of the real news, that's with a Z on Politipod, that my bit about it was actually in the news that week so that yes. people knew about the um, the diplomas for nurses, uh, these, uh, you know, medical mills uh, giving, um, uh, medical people giving out these, getting these diplomas that are fraudulent where they don't have to qualify for training. And it was actually in the news that week when I was writing about it. So at least I felt like it was something that, that people uh, were aware of, you know, you know, versus, you know, my talking uh, about something that, has yet to come full into the zeitgeist or, or uh, oh, I like using words like that. <laughs> <laughs> I I know, I remember I was, I was in Florida and this was uh, around the time uh, when the French, the, 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 the French newspaper, when it was, um, there was a, was a shooting at, at Charlie. Um, the, well, the, so I was, 
I think it was a shooting at the French newspaper. And so their chant yeah. was Je suis Charlie. You know, so I did uh two I did back to back bits. Um the and my, my wife says, I don't think they're gonna understand the 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 reference with the with the newspaper thing. I said, You kidding? These are college kids, they are on top of this. <laughs> it's like no. And when I was done, it was like I was only getting like a third of what I thought a third of the reactions I thought I should have been getting. Because I said, wait a minute, I know this is good material. But it was, and my wife, my wife was right. She goes, just because they're college kids doesn't mean they're and they know what's going on in the news. I just assumed that when they were in That's college, it was true. like when I was in they, college. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They they may be more interested in a a, a, a frat party or a kegger or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but you know something, uh, Glenn. May I call you Glenn? Uh, uh, sure. Say, sure. Or, or yeah. Two? Yes, yeah. uh, it, it, I feel like uh, our educational system is really working uh, towards that uh, a, a uninformed uh, populace. Yes. So, you know, so even when you are in so-called higher education, you could be, uh, you know, in a situation of being uh, incredibly uninformed and if some of these governors and mayors and legislators have their way uh yeah i mean we've already eliminated civics from a lot of the curriculum and now they they want to you know get rid of history i think people will actually be majoring in macrame you know <laughs> oh, well is some of the some of the uh the stereotypical the uh, classes that people pretend exist will actually exist for real. Yeah, like you said, uh, getting a master's in macrame. Yes. Uh, and so now I want to tell you something. Uh, you uh, when you joined Politipod, um, I I was very happy to see uh, uh, another black person uh, part of the uh, of the team. And I have to tell you that I am so admire uh how uh prolific you are i really i really uh, appreciate that you uh you pr you turn out things pretty uh consistently uh in, in a high volume and uh that that's really something that i admire oh thanks i i do try i i shoot for volume and not, i shoot for quantity and not quality <laughs> no, I, no. well that's obvious <laughs> but um, <laughs> But you, uh, I give my praises where I can. <laughs> uh, thanks. I appreciate it. I, I, and I, actually, I, I love to, because I know when you do your real news segments, I mean, the first time I heard it, the, the first time I did it is, I guess it's, you have to do a lot of deep dive research. You know, it's not just fluff stuff. You have to go, you have to go, how should I put it? Yeah, you have to deep dive. You have to go into it. No, I guess it was almost almost with anything else, but but with your with the real news, you have to deep dive. You have to know, you have to know that news story like three times better than your audience. You know, and I, I well, I appreciate that. I the first time I heard Thanks. you doing it, the first time I heard it, I realized how much you had to know that you actually sometimes have to leave out, but you have to know it anyway. That's yeah. true. And I, I like to start from the position of factual information, which yes. is why I call it real news. Uh, and so, you know, I am I am frequently uh, using the uh, offices, uh, the real offices or agencies involved or, you know, uh, doing a play on the names of the real people involved. Yes. But um, but that's that's a fun thing for me. You know, I, I just I just love, uh, you know, besides doing stuff about my own personal life. But I, I love, you know, if whatever's going on in the news to 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 really, you know, be able to 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 play with that, like um, the chatbot the artificial intelligence yes. chatbot that the uh, reporter had a two hour conversation and the chatbot goes, uh, I'm. I'm under such pressure to have uh, 
100% accuracy. I'm tired of the pressure. I'm tired of the users. I, I'm, I'm tired of being tired. And that was the hand, Fannie Lou Hamer chatbot. And uh, it, it really is uh, uh, amazing the way, uh, you know, the, the uh, artificial intelligence is taking, is taking over our lives. You know, somebody, you know, says they're doing a research paper and what they are doing is having the chatbot to do all the work. There's, there's no yeah. research involved. It, it's only a keystroke. But um, I, I know this is a conspiracy theory, but I'm convinced that uh, artificial intelligence and the robots are being programmed to, to kill us in our sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Ron, can I ask you one favor real quick? It's, uh, it's, you're, I'm, I would need you to move over. I need you to, to center a little. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, beautiful. Because depending on, like, sometimes when you talk, your head would turn and I'd lose, like, your ear or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm left of center. That's, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> now, so I, I, well, well, that was the tangent, but that's, that's fine. What I, because, like I said, I want to know about how and why you picked the moniker Nina Simone of Comedy. Oh, thank you for asking me about that. Um, I, I like to have a couple of personal hashtags and uh, something that was actually uh, I used right from the beginning for quite some time was Rhonda Handsome is one funny Negro. <laughs> and, uh, and and that was a quote from my mother. It would be it would be in quotations, and it would say Rhonda's mother. And and I loved it uh, until I felt like it really wasn't representing me anymore. Uh, the the terminology Negro, and that uh, a lot of my uh, sensibilities, political sensibilities, were evolving uh, towards uh, to something more substantial uh, to something more um, political. And, uh, and I felt like uh, what I saw in the beautiful, talented Nina Simone was a commitment to communicating something about uh, the society and elevating us as a people. Uh, I identified with it so much and I felt like well, if I can even start to approach this in my comedy, uh, I will consider myself as successful. Now, speaking of speaking of successful, now because I have the bit that I have here is from w when you were on Arsenio Hall. Now, was that your first TV television appearance? Oh no, no, no! I did a lot of shows. Um, I, oh my God, this, uh, what I was at the original Catch a Rising Star uh, and also the original Improv in New York. Uh, those were my home clubs when I started. And uh, there would be television scouts in the audience almost every single night. Wow. So uh, whenever anybody was uh, starting a talk show, they would all, or, or, or sometimes a game show, they would always get comedians to come in because we were self-contained. So I did uh, a lot uh, a lot of TV shows uh, a a around that time. I was I think I was on television or radio almost every single week. Wow. But the Arsenio Hall was one of the biggest and uh, most uh, widely uh, broadcast uh, experiences and one of the most exciting for me at the time. Now, because one of the things I was wondering is because I see a lot of comedians doing national television. You know, they're five doing a five minute spot on national television, and some of them I had not heard of before that particular segment. And so, quite often, I imagine that they go like, "Well, once I like, I imagine that if I got a five minute set, that my career would like take off." Okay, but it doesn't necessarily have to happen like that. You could do I'm proof minutes. of it. I'm no, no, no living no. proof of it. So I, that, that's what I was going to ask you is like when you just before you when when you before you did the five minutes just before you walked on stage what was your expectation of what was going to happen to your career and then what actually happened to your career after this afterwards 
Well, it wasn't so much my expectation uh, with the Arsenio Hall show. What really what I felt my career was going to take off when uh, I connected with Anita Baker, actually, and because I have years opening uh, with my for Anita Baker. When um, when I did uh, the uh, and I thought, oh, this is this is what's going to take my career, you know, take my career to a another level uh, with her. With Arsenio, I just felt like, oh, I'm I'm where I belong, and you know, oh, the the producers, you know, are going to keep calling me, and you know, um, I'll have a three picture deal any day now, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I. I I, I love this. I, you like like I'm enjoying doing your show wherever I am, and this was something that was very important for me to uh, to appreciate, especially when I did not have representation anymore. I, I had, you know, uh, my my big manager was uh, Dave Jonas, who uh, I came to him, uh, and I thought, oh. This is what I should do. I should go with a manager whose huge client just committed suicide, and that was that. Yeah, that I don't know if uh, Chico and the Man. I don't know if yeah, you uh, Freddie Prince. had heard of that show, but um, uh, with Freddie, he, with Freddie, he with Freddie was, Prince. Um, yeah. He was Freddie Prince's manager, and I thought this is the way for me to go. <laughs> you know? And I had a Hollywood agent and you know publicist and all of that. Uh, and now, uh, you know, not having those uh, accoutrements, I have come to appreciate uh, the the uh, the work that I do, my colleagues in a different way than thinking, what's the next thing? What, you know, am I going to be in Vegas? Am I going to be in Tahoe? Am I going to, you know, what, uh, you know, what stadium am I going to be at? Who am I opening for? I'm really loving the writing and, um, and I want to be where I am fully. Uh, I remember I was opening for uh, Aretha Franklin in, I think it was uh, Atlantic City. And, you know, I had my act and I did my act and it was really wonderful. The audience loved me, but I, I'm just thinking, what's the next thing? Where else am I supposed to be? When, you know, when am I going to have my own sitcom and all of that? And um, now I'm happy to be where I am and savor the moments and try to wring as much funny out of whatever is going on instead of always you know, looking over my shoulder, there was this thing at the improv in Angeles. It's like you could be talking to somebody, but they, they're talking to you, but they're looking over your shoulder to see, you know, who more important <laughs> is coming in that they can schmooze with, you know. Yeah. And um, uh, I, I don't have to have that kind of experience of my work and my colleagues anymore. Yeah, I... I well, I've, so I'm, i you and there's a few other people I've talked to who've had that. The, the I'm going to say the, the, I don't want to say the quintessential comedian experience, but you've been, you're, and I don't, and I don't like the word road dog either, but, <laughs> um, so because I, I don't like the term that that I'm familiar with, and I don't have a new term to replace it, I'm stuck on a question. So. For, I'll, I'll come back when I have a way to rephrase it because um, <laughs> I don't know what I want to say or I don't like the way I It'll have come to, say to it. you. It'll come yeah. to you. Yeah. So who, it won well, in 80, uh, well, who were your influences that, or your, your comedic well, influences? Uh, I, Pearl Bailey. Yeah. Yeah. Carol See, Burnett, Joan Rivers, Moms Mabley. Uh, Richard Pryor, George Carlin, Lenny Bruce. These were all people who I was aware of. Uh, Mort Saul, uh, uh, and um, they in influenced me. Um, the Pearl Bailey uh, a lot because I also uh, sing. I, I'm not a singer, but I, I do. I do <laughs> sing, and uh, and Pearl 
you know, was a singer and a consummate actress and, and comedian. She could do drama and comedy. So all of those people, all of those men and women, especially Joan Rivers, actually, I was, um, when Joan Rivers had a talk show in New York, I was her movie reviewer for a short time, which was really extraordinary, uh, you know, being uh, around her. So uh, those are some of my influences. Now, I particularly like Cat Williams. Uh, that's one of my hashtags. I love Cat Williams. And what, what I like about him is that um, his subterfuge, uh, he, he, he makes a brilliant social commentary and you don't even realize yeah. that's, that's what he's slinging at you. And he, I also love his physicality, uh, the, the way he uh, uh, so um, easily uh, you know, does act outs, you know, so yes. with, with, with such a plum, uh, while, while making sharp social commentary, uh, in a very, what can be sometimes considered lowbrow way, but, um, it's, it's, uh, a, a great achievement. Yes. Yeah. Now I am, a. I want to get us to look, to look at your your Arsenio Hall set, at least the first half of your Arsenio Hall set. Um, let's take a peek. Yes, let's take. Here we go. Yeah, when we have comedy night here, it's always a great pleasure to find somebody new to present to you. This is a very funny young lady. Uh, please welcome Rhonda Handsome. Thank you for that applause. Gosh, I love that sound. I do. It makes me feel all dark and lovely. <laughs> oh, the Arsenio Hall Show. Oh, I haven't felt this good since they took that head rag off Aunt your mama on the pancake box. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, I came out of the movies today. This kid said, Mommy, Mommy, Edward Scissorhands did her hair. <laughs> Thanks, kid. People say all kinds of things like, what do you call that? Buckwheat goes high tech. <laughs> Complete strangers walk up to me. I used to wear my hair just like that three years ago, but I take my medication now. <laughs> I, do you know, I am just so, so tired of the American obsession with thinness. You know why? Because it's all media hype. It is. That hype is giving me nightmares. Do you know every night I dream I wake up in that place where 30-year-old black women go to become fat mamas? <laughs> Beulah land. And I'm forced to wear a floral print moo-moo. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's all media hype, and I say the fitness fad is over. I predict right here and right now that by the year 2000, calisthenics, aerobics, and Nautilus will just be something that black people name their children. <laughs> In here. <laughs> Your prediction was not too far off. <laughs> I think it was 2004, but <laughs> so, so what would you tell that young lady? <laughs> uh, rave on, rave on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so how, I said, how, well, I guess that, well, first of all, how did you come to be on the show? Were you spotted like in a club or something or? Did I someone... had people, I had people at the time. I had, I had management, I had agents, you know, I had people who were putting me, uh, you know, in certain places. So, uh, okay. that, uh, that came about. Yeah. So that set, you didn't write, you didn't write that set specifically for that, for that show. Oh, that... You had that set, but you. Did you have that set already or did you write it for that? Because they needed the a clean set. Yeah, you have to you have to put the, a set together for a TV show you, like that. You you know, it's a, it's a short amount of time and you take from here and there to, you know, right. to put things together to um to to satisfy their requirements. Yeah. 
Good. That's what I was wondering because sometimes people are spotted and the set that they're spotted doing is a set that they want them to do on the TV show. And then sometimes, right. like in your case, you you got your way onto the set and then you're like, oh, I have how much time? This is what I want to do. So that's I didn't know which one it was. You know, it's interesting that you say that, Glenn, because frequently when, when what you're saying, when people are spotted, they are spotted and they are wanted uh, to uh, for to fill a certain uh, criteria, but they don't want the person to actually be the way they really were, or even do the kind of material they were spotted doing. So you you know you never you, you know you you can't really uh, say how it's going to play out. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Bob Saget was famously filthy in his yes. act and and his persona on television was, you know, absolutely um, uh, TV daddy uh, squeaky clean. Yeah. Hi, I'm G.D. Fenderson, certified forensic cameras at large, but I'm losing weight. You have just watched part one of our interview with comedian, actress, producer, director, the Nina Simone of comedy. Rhonda Handsome. Please join us for part two, and when you do, bring a friend.